I love to use technology to make beautiful things. And you know, today, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to give you the story about how I stumbled across this new kind of photography, how it's changed my life, and how I believe it can change your life too. You know, maybe you're like me and you came to this haunting realization that you've only got one shot at life. So you might as well make it awesome. And I believe that a life worth living is a life worth recording. So here's a few examples of this new kind of photography. There's a quote about me. It's not a good one. It's that I, quote, have done more to damage the integrity of photography than anyone else in the world, end quote. And what is this evil thing I've done? I hear you wondering. Well, basically, I've given permission to millions of people around the world, and I give permission to you today to break all these hollowed rules of photography and go ahead and post-process the hell out of your photos. Because I think this is really kind of fun. I give you permission to have fun with your photos and find your own sense of creativity and childlike fascination through your art. I think that photography is something that you can easily add into your life. Whatever you happen to be doing, you can augment what you're currently doing with photography. And you can kind of find this elusive right brain that's kind of been there along with you the whole time. And I don't think that post-processing is evil. In fact, I think that the use of artifice in your craft is virtuous. So here I am. Uh, this is the, the spawn of evil. This is me as a kid. Uh, you can see me there on a big wheel. I was pretty awesome. And I'll talk about this one in the middle of me with my Atari 2600. I, I loved that thing. And there was this chess game. I don't know if you remember it. But when the computer would think, uh, the screen would go blank, and it would do a random RGB color. And every few seconds, it would it would change colors. And I would just sit there and stare at it. And I would look for patterns. And I was mesmerized. And I caught something that ended up accidentally informing my photography in much later years. I'll file that away. I'll get to that when we get to the tutorial section, because I'm also going to show you how you can do this kind of photography, too. And then just past that picture of my, my dad and I and a rock, is you can see me over there. I'm cross-eyed. and. Uh, like, like he said, I, I was born in blind, blind in one eye. I still am. And so I see the whole world in 2D. And this turned out to be sort of a, a weird thing, but actually a tremendous advantage because we all kind of see the world in 2D now, don't we? With flat screens. We look at screens all day. And we actually see a 3D world in a 2D device. So this has been a fun challenge for me and one that I kind of keep examining is how do you take a 3D world and present it in 2D? Because the brain loves to see Z depth. It likes to know how far away opportunities and, and challenges are and paths and, and all these kind of things that are very deep inside our, our brains. So fast forward a few years, I, I go to university and I, I fall in love with algorithms. I, I major in computer science. And this is another vector, along with the 2D, that came to inform this, this style of photography that I stumbled into. The question is about light. So if you're in a given situation, you want to try to capture it, how it really feels while you're there. And maybe you go into places, and you take photos, and they come out flat, and you're just disappointed. You're like, oh, what a, what a bummer. But it's actually, there's a disconnect that's happening. Your camera, even a good camera, can probably only capture three stops of light. So what's a stop? A stop is a little measurable segment of light. Whereas the eye, the human eye, can see about 11 stops of light. So that's a huge disconnect, three stops of light versus 11 stops of light. In any given situation into which you might find yourself, there could be anywhere from 8 to 15 stops of light. So the philosophy behind this method, before I get to practically how it's done, the philosophy is you take in your camera, you use it to sweep through all the available light, you capture it, you go back, you dump all of that light back on your computer, and then you bend the light to your will. That's the idea behind it. 
So I believe that an artist creates for the sake of creation, and he shares as his means of connecting with the world. And I think that you guys can probably uh, really benefit from adding this kind of stuff because you go on, you go to cool places, you see neat things, and maybe you're like me, you experience them in kind of a cinematic way, and you want to be able to capture them in this sort of evocative way. And you can easily add this into your life with some of these techniques. And in sort of a side note, you know, you can find that there's this creative part inside of you that's been lurking there all along, and you can softly nurture it with this style of photography. So here's a case study for you of someone that's done this. Uh, this is uh, Tom Anderson. You guys might know him. Uh, he's the guy that started and sold MySpace many years ago. Well, we, we met on Google Plus uh, just over a year ago, and I think it's just coincidental that we happen to be right there, right there in the rankings. And we kind of started this bromance, totally straight bromance, by the way. And uh, we got together, and I found out that he was photo curious. And so <laughs> we, uh, we started taking photos together. We kind of have this uh, master and apprentice relationship, not a master-servant relationship that's very different. And so anyway, we end up going all over, all over the world and taking photos. And, and you can see how much progress he's made in just one year. And he didn't even have a camera over a year ago. And I think this is really cool that, that this has you know, meant something to his life. And, and it's kind of added to it. And, and he's finding new ways to express himself. Because I think that self-expression is one of the most natural and uniquely human things about all of us. So what's going on here? Well, this all falls largely within the magisterium of something called HDR, which is an acronym for high dynamic range. And this photo directly behind me is a non-HDR photo. The HDR version is, is over there. And I have a full tutorial on my website, which is called stuckincustoms.com. Uh, you can go there and, and figure out uh, this stuff step by step. But it's really easy. You can be up and running in, in less than half an hour. Basically, instead of just take, taking one photo like that, you take multiple photos, all right, at different shutter speeds. So you have many levels of light. And you take all that and you run it through another program on your computer. And then this algorithm takes over. And if you're wondering how the algorithm really works, what happens is it analyzes the photo uh, on a pixel by pixel basis. It goes through, it looks at the nearest neighbor, and it maps the tone of the color according to a set of coefficients. And those coefficients you get to slide around using really fun little sliders and tools and things like this. That's basically how it works. So HDR photography, and this, so this style largely, um, it's still uh, hated by a lot of old school photographers. But as far as I can tell, the public seems to love it. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> which is fine. I, I never find any need to. Uh, uh, to impress my peers. So anyway, these, this photo was the, uh, the first HDR photo hanging in the Smithsonian. Uh, that made my mom proud. Uh, this one over here is, uh, I uploaded that to Google Plus about a year ago, and already has over 35 million views. Altogether, these kinds of photos have hundreds and hundreds of millions of views. And there's lots of people that are doing all kinds of weird post-processing. And I hope you, you join with us, because we're having a great time. And in a way, we're, we're kind of going through this neo-Renaissance. And we're fighting the same kind of system that the Impressionists had to fight at the end of the 19th century. Uh, the Manets, the Monets, Renoirs, Caillabats, they In order to get your stuff seen back then, you had to get it hung in the salon in Paris. And you had to pass this panel of octogenarians. And the only way to get past them was if you could have your style be like the, the greats that they considered like the Messaniers and these sorts of things. Well, luckily, uh, you know, back then, uh, the, the center of the art world was Paris. Uh, but now, the internet seems to be the locus. So let's talk a little bit about the, the color that's happening inside these photos. How, what's going on here exactly? What you'll notice is that color groupings make different amounts of sense based on their nearest neighbors. There is a 
fiction that's been going on in your mind for a number of years. We saw this, this cube earlier today. I, I love it. And it reminds you that, OK, yellow and brown are supposed to be two different colors, but maybe sometimes they're the exact same color. Uh, same thing with every other color that you think you know. You have this wonderful perceived fiction in your brain that's, that's made up your whole life so far. But really, none of it's true. And colors make most sense within the context of other colors that they're nearby. And you can see that you can reuse certain color groupings, and they have very different meanings in different ways. If you think back to when I was talking about the, the chess screen changing color, well, this requires great cognitive focus. And I'm sure you guys can handle it in this crowd. So if you look at something that's green, let's say, OK, and then your eyes move over to something that's black, well, when you look at the black, you're actually seeing the inverse of green through a thin film on top of that black, and it dissipates as a function over time. But this is actually happening you know, dozens of times per second as your eye starts to dart around a photo. Because you might look at uh, like one color, and then you move to another color. But you're actually seeing that next color through a thin film of the opposite color that you just looked at. So there's this wild symphony of colors and sensation that's going on as you look at photos. Uh, as you start to explore photography, you really start to appreciate light, and you, you see all these gentle truths through life. So fast forward quite a bit. About six years ago, I started a website called uh, stuckincustoms.com. It's become the world's number one travel photography blog. And along with that, I do all this social media stuff too. Um, I think with, with Google+, and uh, Pinterest, and Facebook, and Twitter, and all this stuff, I have about 7 million followers, something crazy. Uh, every day, I, I share a bunch of different photos. I talk about the adventure behind them. I talk about how they were made, uh, the technology behind them. Um, I do all kinds of like tech reviews of cool tech and cool software that kind of help your right brain life. Um, we started a website called flatbooks.com, which has about a, a couple dozen different authors that write ebooks to kind of help you down your own right brain path. And I feel kind of like we're all going through this discovery together. So. You guys are welcome to, to join up and, and have fun, and, and we can experience this kind of new age of art together. I think it's a, it's a great time. So uh, I love spaceships. I love taking photos of spaceships. Uh, grab me later at the conference. I've got a good story about this space shuttle going up into the cloud, if you're into spaceship stories. Uh, and as long as I'm up here, I'm going to use this as my own personal a thinly veiled plea, because I know some of you guys in the audience also like spaceships, and you have spaceships. I'd, I'm talking to you, you know, Branson and, and Sergey and Bezos. I'd love to come take photos of your spaceships and spaceports. I'll make them look awesome. I'm, I'm waiting on your call. OK, next. <laughs> so I love this idea, too, that we have uh, the human brain seems to try to maximize the amount of beauty and interestingness we can see in any given day, doesn't it? It seems like we orient our day so that we can have as much beauty as possible jammed into our skulls. And this is one reason that photographers love Google+, Plus, is because our images are big and bold and wide, and, and people can scroll through. It's a very efficient, nice interface for, for people to have the highest level of beauty per second that goes into their eyes. Uh, we did something similar over on, on Pinterest where I cropped my stuff. I hated to crop it so tight. But I'm very interested in that form factor, too, because I think that the way an image is displayed is dependent upon the medium in which it's enjoyed. So that seems to be another method where people jam a lot of beauty into their skulls. There's also this idea that's emerging right underneath us, that the way humans are starting to communicate with each other is really changing. For hundreds of years, we've been using the written word to communicate concepts on a global scale. But now that there's over a billion people with cameras and connections to the internet, I think the way we are telling stories is starting to change. Because in a way, uh, you can say photos are easier and superior to words. Not always superior. It's not better or worse. Sometimes it's different. But certainly, a, an image is universal. And a Paul Ekman-esque face makes sense in every culture across the world. And I think that what's happening right underneath us is that there's a new visual literacy that's coming online as we all learn to tell stories 
through a photo or series of photos. So I think it's a very interesting time to be part of this, this image making world. All right, so I'll, I'll end my talk here. This is, um, this is New Zealand. This is where I've, I've just moved with my, my wife and my three kids. And uh, it's, it's really thanks to you know, all, all of you guys. You guys have built up um, uh, uh, services and infrastructure and, and all kinds of things that have, that have made the, my life possible and stuck in customs grow and, and this sort of thing. So I, I don't take any of it for granted. I don't take any of you for granted. And the last thing you can think about is as you start to add photography to your life, you'll be able to reuse this conjurer's bag of tricks for photos of those most important to you in your life. And these cinematic moments that you feel very deeply, you can, you can add these tricks to the photos of these people, your loved ones. These are, these are some of my mine. Uh, over there, this is from New Zealand. That's my, my daughter on a little miniature horse. Seems like a very hobbit-like thing to do in, in New Zealand. Uh, this is my, my son and my youngest daughter. Here's my kids with a, a little Neil Rockwellian Christmas. Um, that's my youngest daughter and my lovely wife who's sitting out there probably embarrassed. And, and there's uh, me and my son. That reminds me of my dad holding my hand on the rock. Thank you for your time. <laughs>